This is the moment of your admission into our ancient and venerable, illustrious order. Stone is the source of towering structures, rough, uncarved stone. Generations of master builders have created majestic buildings from it. For that, they needed a wealth of skills and knowledge, and close collaboration and teamwork. Master builders had a special standing in society. They presented themselves with pride, like stonemason Anton Pilgrim here beneath a pulpit in St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. From his window lookout, he watches over life in the cathedral, the tools of his trade in hand. They are the tools that became the symbols of Freemasonry in the 18th century. Freemasonry is predominantly a product of the 1700s, but it is based on even earlier origins, such as the cathedral workshops and stonemasons' guilds that thrive from the Middle Ages through to the early modern period in European history. Then Freemasonry became a big catch-all. It was the institutional success of the 18th century and comprised two intertwined branches. On the one hand, there was the hermetic, esoteric branch that emphasized symbolism and rituals far more than its counterpart, which was more attuned to Enlightenment ideals. Under the shelter of secrecy, the lodges also provided a safe haven during the Age of Enlightenment to discuss topics that were considered risky in the milieu of absolutism. The basic principle behind the fraternal organization is quite simple, to go through life with friends and learn and grow from one another. 
to be bonded in ritual and aspire to shared ideals. In many ways, we Freemasons are idealists. You can't imagine a perfect world without being an idealist. It wouldn't be possible to write idealistic songs, conceive thoughts and compose if there were no counterpoint to our imperfect world that allows us to say we must glorify that. We have to pit the notion of freedom against it. Dagegen stellen. Mozart's The Magic Flute is an opera that deliberately poses many riddles. The composer had every intention of playing with the secrecy that enshrouds masonry. A small castle deeply nestled in the forest countryside of the Waldviertel region of northern Austria is an ideal place to embark on a journey into Freemason history. Though by today's standards it may seem far off the beaten track, Rosenau Castle marked the midway point between Vienna and Prague. It's easy to imagine Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart making a stopover here not only to enjoy the hospitality, but also to visit a special and mysterious chamber. Even the entrance discreetly reveals the true purpose of this place. Not long ago, a secret Masonic temple was discovered here. An aura of authenticity fills the air. The brethren from Vienna gathered here to hold their ritualized meetings, which had been strictly forbidden by the Empress.
Little is known about the role music played in Masonic ritual. Combining musical improvisation and creative imagination, a group of Viennese Freemasons reenact Mozart's initiation ritual as rendered by experts. This is the moment of initiation for the candidate seeking membership as an apprentice. My brethren, permit he who has been in darkness to see the light, whose appearance has been obstructed from the hour of his birth until this joyous moment. Worshipful Master, in the name of all those present and in the name of our brethren strewn across the earth, he has been deemed worthy of the light. Brother Warden, let he who has been in darkness see the light. Sir, these swords are raised to defend and protect you, no matter where in the world you should find yourself. But know that these blades will be drawn by avenging hands should you break your Masonic oath and secrecy. In the hope that these swords never be tainted by the despicable blood of an unworthy brother, we lower them to the temple floor. This is the moment of your admission into our ancient and venerable illustrious order. By the power vested in me, I now declare you a Freemason knight and apprentice and a member of this worshipful order. Of course, in modern-day Vienna, the procedure is somewhat less threatening than it was during the Baroque era. Many of Austria's 70 lodges pass through an imposing doorway adorned with Masonic symbols to hold their meetings. The secrets here are out in the wide open. At the point where music meets masonry, Mozart plays a key role. It's a topic presented in detail at the recently renovated Mozart House Vienna. The composer had one of his loveliest apartments here. And it was here that he came into contact with the Freemasons of Vienna under the rule of Emperor Joseph II. Inside, visitors can expect a surprise in typical Mozart fashion. Mozart's playfulness is apparent in the magic flute, and with equal enthusiasm, he loved playing along with the Freemasons. Mozart was here during the heyday of the Freemason movement in Vienna. In 1785, 
he composed key Masonic music, and that all happened more or less right here. Ganz ganz wesentliche Musik für die Freimaurer komponiert. Das ist alles. He wrote festive lodge songs and instrumental accompaniments to the rituals. Logengesänge, die hier auch feierlicher Natur waren. He attended lodge meetings with great fervor and must have felt incredibly drawn to the whole spirit of the Enlightenment with its humanitarian ideals and concept of mankind. And he must from this whole spirit of the Aufklärung and this... He composed more music here than anywhere else. ...and menschenbilder that unglaublich angesprochen worden sein. An unbelievable amount of chamber music. Three of the famous Haydn quartets, which were dedicated to his fatherly friend and fellow composer Josef Haydn. Unglaublich viel an Kammermusik. Denken wir an drei der berühmten Haydn quartets. Mozart also wrote eleven piano concertos here. The song Das Feilchen and, of course, operas such as The Impresario and The Marriage of Figaro. But he also composed a lot of music for the Freemasons. Mozart's Masonic music attests to the turbulent times in Vienna. Quite in contrast to Scandinavia, where the union between music and masonry practically springs forth from nature. One of Sibelius's lodge brothers wrote a Masonic poem that impressed the composer so much that he added it to his Finlandia composition as a choral work. So, nowadays, performing the complete Finlandia means playing a Masonic poem set to the music of Finlandia. Many of Sibelius's works are Masonic compositions. He made no secret of his association with the Freemasons and went on to become the Grand Organist of the Grand Lodge of Finland. In essence, he was the director of music, and he was very involved in the use of music for Masonic activities. After a century-long ban by the Tsars of Russia, the first Finnish lodge was revived in 1922 under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of New York. Sibelius was one of the 27 candidates who sought admission. He later became the Grand Organist both in Helsinki and New York. attempt to define Masonic music is bound to leave you tongue-tied. Profound, meditative sounds are as much a part of the repertoire as are Albert Lortzing's upbeat and cheerful songs. Lortzing wrote very festive drinking songs, and Freemasonry has always been a typical mix of seriousness and light-heartedness. 
In other words, alongside serious Masonic-style activities and lectures, there are always very festive, but of course also serious table lodges. Lutzing was a composer who could also write songs. Today, he might be called a Schlager pop artist. They were songs you could sing along to. Many of the pieces in the opera Tsar and Zimmermann were originally written for the lodge and then later revised to fit a different context. Mit Zepter, mit Krone und Stern, das Schwert schon als Kind ach, ich schwang es so gern. Wenn wir ein Beispiel haben wollen für einen Transfer. The Tsar's Aria in Lortzings Tsar und Zimmermann is an example of music transferred from a Masonic context to a secular one. In the famous Tsar's aria, Peter the Great reminisces about his childhood. In the lodges, the same melody was used, but with different lyrics. Two stars in heaven on high shed light and delight on the world. Friendship and love, as the mason knows, bond hearts and establish ties. Friendship and love stand in close union. How blessed, how blessed to be a mason. Contemporary music doesn't have it easy with Masonic themes. Here, young musicians are rehearsing at a lodge in Cologne, Germany. Es Maurers wandeln, es gleicht dem Leben und sein Songs sculpted from the Masonic poetry of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe by bringing modern music in tune with classic literature. Compare that to the music of an American Freemason where the connection takes a more associative approach. American composer Duke Ellington was also a Freemason. His song, I'm Beginning to See the Light, highlights the Mason's spirit of optimism.
Franz Liszt was a key figure in the transition to modernism in the 19th century. Liszt didn't directly compose music for the lodges he frequently visited, but many of his works are infused with the search for new horizons. The same cornerstone topics addressed in Freemason rituals pervade his musical compositions. A cosmopolitan who sought spirituality, Liszt wanted to become a Catholic abbot at the same time he felt at home among the Freemasons. For him, that was no conflict. A good number of lodges welcomed him as an honorary member. For his later operas, Mozart collaborated with an important contemporary, Emanuel Schikanira, a successful theater impresario and performer who later became the librettist of the Magic Flute. Schikanira joined the Freemasons in Regensburg and the fact that both he and Mozart were Lodge brothers greatly influenced their working relationship. Schikaneda's premiere in Vienna was a performance of Mozart's Entführung aus dem Serail, the abduction from the Seraglio, a form of German opera known as Singspiel, which, in a way, can be seen as a kind of bridge to the form of the magic flute.
We know that many sources flowed into the material that ultimately constituted the magic flute. There were many aspects to the history of its development. But Chikaneda performed a variety of operas in the Freihaus Theatre. Some of them were very successful. In part, the emperor pushed for the folkloric element. Alongside Italian opera, he wanted to give audiences a degree of folklore, with mysteries, comic scenes and characters that made people laugh and were a reflection of everyday life. Schikaneda did that in a very intelligent way. The magic flute was very successful and performed many times. But there is also evidence that the reception by Viennese audiences at this suburban theatre wasn't entirely euphoric. Elements that were serious, or couldn't easily be understood at first glance, were by all means cause for some more reserved reactions. Is there a secret message hidden in the magic flute? And if so, what is the secret message? The magic flute is one of the most successful pieces of music of all time. Part of its appeal is surely its many puzzling elements, practically endless interpretations, and Papageno's amusing escapades. The recurring three chords are a reference to Freemasonry, as are the allusion to the three pillars of wisdom, strength, and beauty. Not to mention the ordeals themselves, which portray the partnership between man and woman in a very progressive light.
conflicts in the feudal states of Europe were coming to a head. The principles of the Enlightenment led to the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789. Freemasonry in France was strongly characterized by Republican ideas. Whenever absolutionist structures took hold, be it on the part of the state or the church or elsewhere, a counter spirit arose to speak out for liberation, to be able to sing out openly. So very revolutionary songs emerged. In the case of La Marseillaise, I wouldn't pick it apart in a literal sense, but I do see it against the backdrop of a passion for peace freedom and resistance towards injustice and the like. In other words, its impulse can by all means be found in masonry, when there is suppression from outside, when dependency, absolutism and dogmatism reign. Time and again, there have been composers and lyricists who oppose that in their philosophies, writings, compositions and songs. Reason alone could not have persisted in the face of all the lack of reason that there was in the world. It had to be combined with idealistic visions, and they were often preconceived within the lodges, in step with the Enlightenment. Consider the fact that human rights were formulated by Lafayette and his lodge brothers in Aix-en-Provence. They committed to paper what was later to become a revised version of human rights. Even from today's perspective, that still stands as an ideal. Freemasonry crossed over to America in the early 17th century. One of the oldest lodges is the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts in Boston, established in the early 1730s. Many of the men who were involved in preparing U.S. independence and signed the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. Freemasons in the United States have never had to hide their true colors. Even many U.S. presidents were Masons. Enlightenment principles permeated all aspects of life. Although probably not many of the drivers perched proudly behind the wheels of their cars ever realized it. In places where masonry was persecuted, initiates kept a lower profile about it. Secrecy was more a matter of protection. In America, things were more open, also in terms of admission. But for a long time, there were restrictions against African-American members. They weren't able to join regular lodges and establish their own branch, known as Prince Hall Freemasonry.
Freemasonry doesn't exclude death. The ritual of the Master Mason degree symbolizes the experience and reflection upon death. No one has expressed the Masonic view of death as beautifully as Mozart did in his piece, Masonic Funeral Music. Earnestness towards fundamental matters coupled with social camaraderie are the spice of life in Freemasonry. Germany's smallest lodge is in the northwestern town of Hoya. Members of the Pegasus Association are gathering for this year's cultural festival, a Masonic initiative to network artists and combine Masonic work with pleasure. Music has always played a huge role in social gatherings. Whether people come together as performers to play it or as audiences to enjoy it. Understanding Freemasonry means understanding the inward experience of the ritual. The following ceremonial conferral of the second Masonic degree demonstrates how words, movement and music combine to create a rhythm and ritualized practice that has persisted and progressed for generations. Brethren, let us illuminate our hall that we may commence our work in clearest light. Wisdom. Strength. Beauty. The key factor about the ritual is that it strongly addresses a person's emotional faculties as well. Freemasons believe that insight can also be gained from feelings and not only from cognitive, rational processes. Brother Senior Warden, why do we call ourselves Freemasons? As freeborn men, we build the great building. Which building? Solomon's Temple, as our forefathers called it, in reference to the Temple of Humanity. Where does the junior warden sit in the lodge? In the west, to watch over the ease and refreshment and to call the masons to work. Where does the senior warden sit? In the west, to conclude the work after the setting of the sun. Where does the master sit? In the east, 
the place of the rising sun that illuminates the human world. The worshipful master stands up in the east and presides over the lodge. Let the lodge be opened. The task of our work today is to confer upon two brother apprentices the fellow craft degree. Brother apprentices, upon your initiation we assigned to you the work of carving rough stone, the work of self-growth and building your character. The time has come for you to direct your will and abilities to new tasks. To prove your value in the community, we call upon you to help build a better world. Prepare yourselves. As in the hour of your admission into our lodge, we once again send you on the journeyman's waltz. Follow Brother Master of Ceremonies and follow your own good star. The Freemason's journey continues on, accompanied by the creative influence on music. Gottfried Körner, the father of poet Theodor Körner, asked Friedrich Schiller to write what he called a fiery song for the brethren, a drinking song for the lodge. Schiller did so and used Masonic symbolism, writing three times three verses. That is the famous Ode to Joy, which Beethoven later masterfully set to music in his Ninth Symphony. It includes a line about all men becoming brothers. Ludwig van Beethoven never joined a lodge, but throughout his life his Freemason friends inspired and ignited his artistic work. Schiller initially exaggerated the Masonic ideal of brotherhood by writing about beggars becoming princely brothers. In other words, all people are equal. Beethoven later compressed that quite a lot, but he made Ode to Joy even more famous than it had been as a poem. He set it so skillfully to music in his Ninth Symphony that it is now regarded as a common, universal good. Ja. 